Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I apologize. I'm okay. There we go. Uh, depending on where in the world you're joining us from, welcome to our expert panel, AutoML Evolved, the evolution of automated machine learning with generative AI, brought to you by our friends at Kumo. I'm Brian Mink, co-founder and president of Data Science Connect, the world's largest data and AI community. Today, we're excited to welcome hundreds of attendees from all over the world to discuss the latest advancements in Gen AI that are reshaping AutoML, making machine learning more accessible and effective across organizations. We'll also learn how Gen AI enhances data processing, feature engineering, and model performance, and discover emerging trends that data executives need to be aware of. We're honored to hear from a distinguished panel of experts today. Parth Parikh, Product, Man Product Manager Lead at Kumo, Taj Prasada, Director and Head of AI for North America at Nike, Debu Saha, SVP of Architecture and Engineering at Citibank. Natalia Kuklova, Chief Enterprise Data Chief Enterprise Data Science Officer at Webster Bank. And JC Hoyer, Senior Head of AI, Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Pella. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. To make this feel a little more in person, we suggest you add a photo to your profile and include your bio, LinkedIn profile, and other information you'd want your fellow attendees to see. Next, please take advantage of the Q&A and chat features throughout the talk. We're dedicating a portion at the end to Q&A, so be sure to upvote the questions you'd like the panel to address. If you're wondering where your organization stands compared to others on your AI journey, check out the poll question in the right sidebar. And finally, to learn more about Gen AI and AutoML, check out the calls to action below throughout the webinar from our sponsor, Kumo. Now, without further ado, I'm going to bring our panelists on stage and have them introduce themselves. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. If you guys could just uh, turn your cameras on if they're not already. Perfect. Good to see all of you. Um, so we'll start with quick intros to everyone. Uh, I'll go around the, the horn here as you appear on my screen. And if you could spend about 30 seconds uh, on your background and current role, and then we'll leave plenty of time to jump into the content. Um, so why don't we start with JC? Yeah. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Here we are. So I'm JC Hoyer. Uh, I lead AI, Data Science, and Advanced Analytics at Pella Corporation. For those that may not be familiar with what Pella does, we manufacture windows and doors. We're actually the second or, or first or second largest, depending on how you cut it, a window and door manufacturer in the U.S. So um, I've been with Pella for just shy of five years uh, with a significant focus on uh, driving intelligent operations and how we actually manufacture products. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Welcome, JC. Uh, Natalia? Good. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Natalia Kukova, a Chief Data Science Officer at Webster Bank. Uh, my team and I leverage data to drive strategic decisions across our organization. Um, so we basically focus on everything from optimizing uh, branch locations to creating strategies on how we retain our valuable clients. I'm happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Natalia. Part. Everyone, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Part. My background is in machine learning and product management. Uh, my focus has primarily been on driving business growth using data science. And currently, I'm the head of product at Kumo. Um, in case you're not familiar with Kumo, uh, Kumo basically takes data from your data warehouse and helps you build machine learning models using deep learning um, and, and graph based transformative approach. Thanks, Part. David? Thanks for having me on, Brian. Uh, my name is uh, Debu Saha. I'm with Citigroup. Uh, it probably doesn't need any <laughs> introduction. Uh, one of the three largest uh, banks in the US. I'm part of uh, engineering and architecture organization. I lead initiatives uh, mostly focused on data architecture, engineering, machine learning, and automation. Been in the industry for over 20 years. Thank you. Thanks, Debu. And Taj. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Hi, everyone. Um, I work for this small company called Nike. So, um, I uh, I was running uh, uh, AI for North America uh, for a couple of years, and then my role is now evolving uh, as Gen AI uh, kind of takes hold within our organization. 
So I'm, uh, we're forming a new group and uh, I'm part of product innovation, merchandise, athlete activity, and Gen AI. So there's a whole lot going on there. It's a mouthful. Uh, it just means that I have some really cool stuff that I'm working on as it relates to Gen AI and also trying to implement, uh, which I'm really proud of and it's really hard to do, believe it or not, is uh, AI governance across Nike. Excellent. Well, welcome to all of you. Thanks for the introductions. Um, we're going to start by giving folks a kind of a high level view of our topics for today. Um, so let's start with kind of the basics. What are AutoML and Gen AI? How are they related? How are they going to uh, to inform one another? Uh, Taj, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure. So let's talk about let's talk about Gen AI briefly. But before that, let's go back to the days when Gen AI did not exist or wasn't as popular because now everybody seems to think that AI is only uh, Gen AI, right? Um, I've gone through cycles of, you know, when machine learning became really cool and big data used to be really cool. And uh, I, I feel privileged. Um, I, I thought 10 years ago, I was kind of late to the game I, when I got my master's. Um, there were people who knew so much at that time and I was envious of them. And then today I feel privileged that I, I did not wake up that late, right? I, I did recognize some trends early on. Um, AutoML for me kind of came about uh, after, you know, understanding how to uh, mine the data for information, build models, right? The typical cycle being, you know, anywhere from six to eight weeks minimum from the time you have actually have access to the data and then AutoML, the rise of AutoML came about when um, everything that I could do in six weeks, I could take, as long as the data set was clean, I could upload that. There were you know, a bunch of solutions out there. So I'm not gonna plug any solution, but you know, you can just upload a data set and say, hey, these are my inputs, this is my response variable. Can you give me an output? And what AutoML does is it just uses brute force, which just means that it goes through every single iteration. It picks like the five or seven models and then it just changes all the, 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 the parameters within the model. And then you could say, okay, give me like 250 models or give me 500 models. And then in a matter of minutes, maybe hours, depending on the models you choose and the complexity of the problem, it gives you an output. Um, and then you just pick like, hey, I, I, wanna, I want the best model based on accuracy. I want the best model based on some other metric that you're trying to optimize. So that's AutoML, which I thought was great. And I never thought it was the end all be all. I just thought it was always something that we could use as a reference and say, hey, while I'm doing all this work, let me use that information. And then, you know, it's just going to help me speed things up. And also there are plenty of people who did not kind of know what they were doing, but somehow they were better at AutoML than I was, right? So, or my team was. Um, so that was really interesting. Uh, Gen AI, of course, um, you know, just, Pretty much a greenfield at this point. I think everybody's jumping into it. People are trying to make sense of it. Not everybody fully understands it. I feel like I'm learning like every hour, not every day, but every hour there's something new. And our organization is is really focused on on pushing you know Gen AI products. Uh, and and you know there's there's all kinds of competing opinions and whatnot. So um, still learning that space, still trying to get better. But Gen AI for me is, uh, is, is just this great opportunity. And if you bring that together with AutoML, uh, and we can talk about that some more, but uh, there, there's just this paradigm shift, right? That's happening before our eyes. And, and that's where the greatest opportunity is. So let's stop there, Brian. Yeah, gr great overview. Who else wants to weigh in on that one? I can go next. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the way uh, I characterize uh, AutoML is that it simplifies end-to-end -end process for uh, machine learning uh, to solve real-world problems. Um, AutoML is primarily used by non-experts uh, to use machine learning tools, to use uh, machine learning tools and improve uh, productivity and automating repetitive, complex, and, and most time-consuming tasks. So the, to dig into a little more details, there are six core functions of model development lifecycle, MDLC. So the starting with the data processing, as you know, uh, data being the fuel of uh, automated uh, machine learning, right? So it helps automation of tasks uh, for data cleansing, uh, transformation, and whatever is needed to prepare data for machine learning models to execute on. 
The second in my list is the feature engineering, <coughs> which is, I think a lot of data scientists and data analysts uh, use identification and creation of most relevant features for ML models, right? So they spend a lot of time, auto ML can be immensely beneficial for this, uh, this particular step of the MDLC. The third one is uh, model selection. AutoML helps by automatically uh, selecting most suitable machine learning algorithms and hyperparameters for specific data set, as well as the use cases. The, the fourth in my list is the model evaluation. As you know, there are a lot of uh, AutoML, which is very helpful in, in assessing the performance of the models using the appropriate validation technique and things like that. Outside of these four, uh, AutoML can also be beneficial for model tuning and model deployment. As you know, just like, uh, unlike SDLC, model development lifestyle follows a different <coughs> pattern. What it is basically once we deploy the model and it basically based on the data which is available in production, the accuracy of the model may drift away from the actual, uh, the pre-selected criteria of say 95% or whatever. So that needs to be basically kind of monitored and the models need to be retuned in order for, uh, to get back to the accuracy level, the desired accuracy level, what we want. Uh, <clears throat> the next is uh, the impact of the Gen AI and auto ML, right? So there are four, five areas which I see. The first is basically the natural language uh, interface. The second is the enhanced feature generation, code generation, as you know, uh, Microsoft is using uh, auto copilot uh, heavily, then improved parameter tuning, uh, the, the automated documentation and reporting, which is very, uh, very much required for uh, compliance and adherence to regulatory reports. And this last one is basically simulation and sim synthetic data generation. So these are the six different areas where uh, of Gen AI auto ML can, can be immensely beneficial. Right. Just add two, yeah. two things to that. Because um, yeah, just and, 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 and Debo captured it quite well. My simplified thoughts are: uh, Gen AI brings conversational capabilities, right? And so you think about abstraction of programming language. So historically, you know, going back decades ago, you may needed you needed knowledge of C, C, C sharp, and so on. Eventually, it was abstracted away to knowledge of Python. You kind of go up this ladder. Well, Gen, AI, Gen AI brings that ability. I can interact in natural language, right? And I can write a code in natural language. And so if your organization is uh, developing solutions that are based around infrastructure as code that and enable a, uh, a code-driven sort of deployment, then now uh, you can actually have conversations with it. I think that's very powerful. Um, the other thought I think of with, with AutoML, though, that's I think worth noting is it's just a bit of caution is it, it's easy for it to become a hammer looking for a nail, right? AutoML machine learning by itself is not always the optimal solution every single time. And so I think in this space, uh, it's it's important to, to emphasize the critical thinking capabilities of your practitioners and really, really uh, drive that development and um, all users of this, from the citizen type users to the experts in terms of um, how reliant are we on these capabilities. So just my couple of thoughts on this. Um, just to add to, you know, what JC and Debu uh, and Taj kind of mentioned here, right? Um, you know, I, I feel like what Gen AI has done for natural language processing. So, you know, back in the day, natural language processing used to be, well, here's a bag of words. You're trying to predict the next best word. I think what 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 Gen AI did was, you know, it used all the knowledge from the internet, and you know, added this predictive capabilities uh, to to generate uh, or predict the next best word. Um, I think you know um, what they would just mentioned, right? Like um, that that was really the promise of AutoML, right? Like simplifying the entire work stream of machine learning, and you know, helping across the entire, the, you know, the six or seven different steps that they were mentioned, right? Um, like automating across all those different steps. Um, I think 
you know, going back to your question here, uh, Brian, which is how are they related? How is AutoML and Gen AI related? Um, I, I think AutoML is now primed for, uh, you know, uh, the, the true success um, and, and the true promise uh, that it originally had, which was uh, we can now go from, um, you know, a selective, um, you know, kind of brute force automation to a little bit more intelligent automation around, um, around modeling. Um, and I think I think that's that's kind of what I'm most excited about, um, you know, with AutoML in the, in the near future. Brian, I can add like yeah. another view. Yeah, absolutely. So just to summarize, right? AutoML, as Debo said, right? It's, it's a powerful machine learning tool. It can, you know, automate different tasks, data preparation, you know, model selection, fine tuning. It's all great. With a few clicks, you have good looking predictions. You could put on your presentations, go and see your manager, and you know, look great. But in banking, we actually often call it a black box because, frankly, for non-experts, those models are very hard to explain, you know, how they work. And especially when you talk to regulators, it's kind of, you know, very hard to explain to them. Uh, now we have generative AI, which takes the central stage. It's great, right? It can create features. It creates the synthetic data. It's awesome. But we now have two black box models. Uh, working together. So, you know, many of you, probably all of you know what R squared is in statistics. So now I call AutoML plus Gen AI is actually black box squared process. So it's a kind of the ultimate uh, mystery box. Uh, so the tools are very powerful and helpful, but also they're not perfect. Um, so um, to get the best results, we actually need to have humans involved and carefully use them. Yeah, really, really great points all around. Um, I think laying out very clearly, you know, what what these technologies are, how they might be able to work together in the future, how how I think there's a lot of excitement around potentially what Gen AI can do exactly to what your point, Parth, that, you know, really helping AutoML realize what what the dream was to begin with and, and also democratizing access um, to a lot of these advanced analytics. So um, let's kind of follow up on some of those those thoughts that you guys just had, how do you think in, in the next two to five years, we're going to see Gen AI reshape the AutoML landscape, doing some of those things that, that you all mentioned, like the natural language interface, code generation, where it's a low code, no code, um, you know, enables more of that. How do you see some of these developments playing out over the next few years as, as Gen AI starts to have uh, more of a, a firm footing within various organizations? I mean, happy to, happy to jump in your uh, real quick, uh, Brian. So I, I think um, you mentioned two to five year time frame. I, I think in the near term, um, I feel like the future is going to be a little bit more impatient. Um, I feel like business teams have really, you know, already gotten a flavor of what Gen AI can do. I mean, everybody is familiar with, uh, with chat GPT and, you know, natural language processing is, is almost feels like a thing of the past um, at, at this point. So, uh, you know, I, I think the way the lens I look at this from is twofold. One is um, from a business operation standpoint, I think the expectations from data science teams are going to be like a lot higher, both in terms of, you know, the quality of models that get built, um, the pace at which they, they get built and the business value that we can derive out of, out of those models. So I, I can already start, you know, feeling that there's going to be like a lot more pressure on, on data science teams to deliver value. And, uh, you know, uh, kind of going back here in the near term, I think um, there's definitely a lot of value that Gen AI can provide uh, with, you know, across the different steps of machine learning, right? From, you know, data processing, feature engineering, uh, uh, you know, auto learning models, uh, explainability, right? Um, just just the basic fundamentals of, of the data science, um, you know, process. I think Gen AI can, can definitely add a lot of value on that. Um, however, one thing that I'm really very excited about is, um, is, is, you know, like really leveraging the underlying technology behind generative AI, um, you know, the transformer architecture, what is the equivalent of that, um, for utilizing all the data in your organization? Um, so I, I think that underlying technology is, is what I'm really excited about. So, you know, uh, to simplify this, what I just mentioned, right? Like what Gen AI has done for natural language processing. I feel like AutoML can now do that for, for private data um, that is sitting in, in your data warehouse. 
Um, and I think utilizing that underlying technology is, is what I'm most excited about. Okay, great points. What are, what are some other thoughts there? Uh, what I think is, I think uh, the three areas where uh, it will have huge impact is basically making the uh, making the technology or the AutoML is basically more accessible, efficient, and sophisticated. So uh, it will lower the overall entry barriers. Uh, the second one, what I would like to see is that the broader adoption of across industries, because everybody all across industry, they are basically scratching the, the surface. So once we have the automated, like, as I said, data processing, right? It's a huge task. The data engineers, data architectures takes, uh, they spend a lot of time building the data pipeline and then they have to uh, work on uh, processing or at least maintaining the quality of the data transformation and all those things so those things can be hugely important and beneficial uh, the third one i can think of is the the bias detection and mitigation so because a lot of these models basically are uh, prone to biases right so those things auto ml can be leverage to basically auto ML and GNA AI integrated can be leveraged to that. And the, the fourth one, which is equally important, is just basically a compliance and auditing. A couple thoughts I'll, I'll add, uh, I think is important to keep your on here. One, um, and it's been echoed, but data continues to be critical. It's the ingredient to any any of these tools. And so if you either lack data or it's it's poor quality, Gen AI, auto ML um, aren't, aren't a silver bullet, right? They can inform how to craft the data and maybe even you know, inform your organization on, well, how do we solve for missing data as an example? So I think there's some power in that, but it's a, that's a fundamental um, element that will persist as we go forward. Um, the other side of this, and maybe I'm jumping out a bit further, but you know, the, the notion of agents or, or reasoning that emerges in Gen AI, I think is a powerful notion. And some of you may have read recently how, depending how closely you follow OpenAI, their Strawberry product will be deployed here in a couple of weeks, which is supposed, is supposed to be a significant step forward in reasoning capability, which effectively is taking this Gen AI chatbot and saying, go solve this problem for me and letting it run and iterate and solve the problem, right? And so it's, again, if you think about that in the, in the in the framework of AutoML, AutoML becomes one element of that, where now you can seed that agent with context of the business, context of the enterprise, and allow it to be faced with a challenge and work out what's the best approach to solving that challenge, which might be machine learning or it might be something else. So again, that's not here yet, but my view on it is it will quickly arrive in terms of uh, given the progression we're making in Gen AI capabilities. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can go next. So, so as you guys were talking, I was just thinking about a bunch of things that came to mind. So first, I, I feel uh, uh, bad for you, Natalia, because any highly regulated industry that, you know, and, and insurance and uh, finance banking, right? Um, it's, it's just going to be difficult for you guys, you know, not having that understanding and, you know, black box solutions and even when they're not a black box solution i've had to sit down with like legal teams and say well this is what this means and this is what i felt like i was teaching them machine learning they did not have to teach me how to be an attorney but i had to teach them about machine learning for them to sign off on it um so so it's always going to be a challenge and good luck to you um in terms of uh, uh nlp and, and what park was talking about at at some point in my life i thought i was an nlp expert i had done a lot of work um in nlp I always thought about converting language into a mathematical problem because that's what uh, computers understood. I talked about vectorization and people just looked at me funny. And, uh, but it's true, right? You have to convert it into a math problem. Um, I remember a 72,000 page PDF that you know I needed to, my team and I needed to work on a summarization, which is really easy today. We upload a document and you say, give me a summary, uh, but to actually take you know, a whole bunch of like accounting memos and combine into a super PDF and then extracting that information and making it meaningful was many, 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 many weeks of hard work, not trusting the algorithms that were open source and then just kind of validating that and rewriting some of that code. 
Um, I also remember taking faxes for a really large insurance company that got bought out by a, a uh, uh, another really large company, right? So I can't name names, but uh, they were trying to approve surgery and they were trying to automate that process of reading like a hundred page fax from the doctor's office, physician's office. And then we had to convert that using OCR technology into, uh, uh, you know, an NLP problem, right? With 300 DPIs and then eventually, you know, extracting that information and then making that into an algorithm of saying, it's a binary classifier. Yes, I approve or no, I don't approve. Um, you know, these are very classic use cases. Um, but again, I, if you ask me, Brian uh, and team here, five years is so far into the future. Um, I think about first, I don't want to think past 18 months because I know the world will change. But five years, seven years, let's say 10 years, right? We talk about auto ML as building models. I wonder, I wonder if somebody will think about saying, I have a bunch of books or some kind of movie scripts or something that I've written and, you know, build me a language model, right? So the auto ML using, instead of using traditional models, right, right now we know it's really difficult, right? They are called large language foundational models for a reason. It takes like, I always joke like, hey, they have a building full of machines working to solve the problem. So we can't really do it. Let's just take the output, right? Let's just take the final product. Um, but I wonder if auto ML becomes where, you know, we can build our own, you know, Gen AI based models uh, uh, as a part of the auto ML offering. And maybe that is part of the future. I can quickly jump on uh, one of the examples which we are using. It is it's in a proof uh, of concept uh, for now, but I think that's a good idea. What uh, JC mentioned that uh, the data is being the, the core of all machine learning models, right? The data quality becomes a huge uh, problem. What we are doing is, we being in the bank and regulatory uh, industry, what we cannot do uh, that we cannot expose the data to the AI ML because of so many reasons, right? So what we are doing is we are using the Gen AI to create the synthetic data. That was basically one of the points I mentioned. So what we did is we took uh, probably say uh, a subset of the data, which is basically uh, totally uh, quality maintain the correct accurate data. Uh, and then we use that data to basically create the synthetic data. And then, which is basically probably say 80, 90, 100, or probably 2 million rows, and then run that AI model against that synthetic data. Keeping all the sensitive information, okay, uh, totally masked uh, because it, they are not exposed to the AI or ML models, but the synthetic data is helping the model to train as well as uh, making sure uh, the tuning of the model to uh, achieve that accuracy, what we are basically desiring, basically helps. And then once the model is kind of finalized, then we use that for our production data. That's the way we are basically starting uh, to uh, invest in the GNAI. And we have seen some uh, maybe just to get some good outcome. And hopefully, you are going to be able to take it to the production sometimes down the road. Yeah, very interesting use case. I, I know uh, synthetic data is one of the, the very exciting potential use cases for GNAI is the, the ability to create high quality synthetic data. Um, certainly, a, a vast amount of prior technologies in, in many different spaces. Um, one thing that that a number of you have noted that I think it, it tees off nicely into our next question is this idea of democratizing uh, machine learning. And AutoML has always had the potential to do that. It's made it uh, much faster and easier to build advanced machine learning models. Uh, but now to add on top of that a natural language interface, to add a lot of the capabilities of Gen AI does provide significant opportunities to democratize access to these models across an organization, not limited just to technical users, but also expanding those in, in many cases to business users. So I guess a, a couple of points around that. Um, what do you guys see as some of the biggest opportunities for that? What does that really look like in practice in terms of if you're deploying uh, some of these models to business users? Like what, is, what does that even look like? How do, they, how do they tap into those? And then also what are the associated risks with that? How do you make your, your 
population of business users more data literate. Um, and it's like to Taj's point about training the lawyers about how uh, machine learning works. I mean, how do you do this at scale in an organization as you start to make these capabilities uh, more available to people who maybe don't understand uh, the extent of what is under the hood or how these models work uh, and, and may not have the background that data scientists do, for instance, in being able to evaluate um, some of the, the shortcomings, perhaps, of those models. Brian, I can talk about risks. So I'll sure. be the most conservative on this panel today. <laughs> uh, so in my view, auto email for non-experts, it does sound fun, but it's like giving a Ferrari to someone who just starting to learn to drive. So it's like kind of fast, but risky. Uh, so we do take, you know, talk a lot about uh, making machine learning accessible to everyone, but actually letting people to run those models where they don't understand what those models do, how they are created. It's actually dangerous. Um, again, it's like, you know, a doctor prescribing medicine. You kind of expect him or her to know like what it does. Or like, you know, if we take like chat GPT, right? You don't want chat GPT to tell you to take cough medicine when you have like a broken leg. So kind of same principle applies in banking. We kind of the the um, the most complex tasks should be actually um, left to experts to deal with, not to non-experts. Yeah, I think uh, you know uh, what Natalia just mentioned, right? I, I think uh, um, Jenny, I I think it's 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 like a double-edged sword, right? Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, uh, you know, on one hand, I think it, it has a lot of promise for um, increasing access across, you know, business users in the teams or even access to non-tech teams, right? Um, with this easy to use chat-like interface. Uh, but I think where it becomes very dangerous is the fact that Gen AI at the end of the day is, is you know, um, is at best, like, you know, next word prediction, right? Um, which is trained across uh, the knowledge of the internet. So it's really good at it, but uh, that does not mean it's always going to be right. So, uh, you know, uh, while there is a promise of, uh, uh, you know, increasing access to, 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 to a lot of non-technical users, um, I think we perhaps will have to start by drawing a boundary with a human in the loop um, having guardrails in place uh, and, uh, you know, limited access to, to organizations. Um, or when I say organization, meaning teams, uh, which are non-technical and uh, for very specific use cases, perhaps. Um, having said that, I think uh, at the same time, um, you know, Gen AI is going to be great at improving accuracy of models, having data scientists do really, really, really quick iterations um and solving more problems than ever before um leveraging more data than ever before um so there, there are definitely a lot of positives to it uh, but then at the same time we'll have to we'll have to uh, be very very careful especially in more regulated industries um to to draw guardrails and and not having users uh, or business users confuse the output as being right just because it's you know being thrown out being spit out um in, in a chat like really convincing interface um so yeah in 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 city uh, being part of the engineering and architecture organization what we do is we have exposure to all the different technologies right but the way we the, we strategize and we plan is basically not everything okay can be used okay to uh, benefit the business so a lot of times what we do is we see hey this is a great technology why can't we just take this and see what business cases we can align it to that's not the right approach. The way we do is closely work with the business uh, stakeholders, understand the business problem, and see what technology can be aligned and get the benefit out of it so that the business gets the maximum uh, output. It's like when I have, say, something in, in Amazon, like say, there's a great fan, it works on a Bluetooth, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, if I don't need a fan, then it doesn't matter how much how good the pan is, right? So if we don't take this approach, most likely it's going to fail. So, but the thing is that when the need is coming from the business, they see the value, and then we try to align the technology accordingly. So that's the way I see 
the most <coughs> value you can get out of the uh, GNI as well. Yeah, great points. I think um, to, to the point earlier about not every, uh, we need to be careful about a hammer in search of a nail. I think that's a, exactly the same point here. It's like, just because you have the technology and it can do lots of amazing things, doesn't mean those are things that are needed from the business standpoint. And, and on conversely, you know, business users have certain needs and, you know, maybe that needs to be something that the data and IT teams need to help them implement as opposed to something that they are able to run off and, and do completely on their own uh, untethered. Uh, so I think those are those are great points. Um, I guess the, the next question is around interpretability and transparency of, of models. So we we've, we've talked a bit, a bit about that. Um, how do you see that working uh, sort of in in the real world, especially in in heavily regulated industries? I mean, and and also we understand that Gen AI does have uh, hallucinations from time to time that it's not 100 percent accurate. So if you are using it for transparency, auditability in very high stakes situations like in disclosures you're making to regulators, how do you ensure that that it is accurate in what information it's providing you about uh, your models and, and the documentation that it's providing? Yeah, I'll 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 take that. Um, so I have never gone away from the idea of doing A/B testing and multivariate testing, and you know, trust but verify. Um, I I haven't done it yet. I have not implemented this, but if I can use Gen AI to say, explain the cause and effect relationship, which I don't need Gen AI to explain it to me, but maybe it writes it in a nice fancy way. Um, but then once you take that output, you have to validate it, right? Like the beauty of math um, has always been, it's all reversible, right? It's like a, it's like a chemical reaction and you know, that's like reversible. So math is if left side equals to right side, right? So usually if you're solving a mathy problem, you know, even though it's in English, you know, there has to be a way for you to test it. Like, okay, this is the explanation that I have. Now let me go and test it and let me validate it. And uh, so I think that's one way to mitigate hallucinations. There might be other ways, right? But the more classic way is do some kind of an A-B test as well. Um, in terms of um, model explainability, again, I imagine you can tell ask a Gen AI engine and say, hey, you know, explain this model to me that's doing this, this, and this. I'm sure you have to train it with the right prompts. I'm sure you have to say, hey, if I give you these questions, give me these output back. Again, I have not implemented it. So I'm just talking, you know, maybe using my imagination more than anything else. Um, but there's definitely an opportunity because again, um, in publicly traded companies like mine and other regulated industries, and we have the panelists here from those industries, you have to be able to, the whole approval framework to me is like a risk mitigation framework, right? Like has legal signed off on it, has privacy signed off on it, has brand protection signed off on it, has, you know, like everybody has to do their due diligence. And so there's a huge, risk mitigation and along the way somebody's going to say no and the way you get them to say yes is like hey let me prove that what i'm doing is valuable but it's also not going to hurt us in any way right we shall do no harm right so that's really important and um that's what i would do right i would i would trust the gen ai engine until the point that i could verify it and then i would verify it and say hey the result i got was actually good maybe sounds like a lot of redundant work but I think it's really important um, to incorporate Gen AI into our processes. And the reason is then you can truly say that you're realizing the power of, and the potential. Otherwise, you're saying, I'm not going to include it in my product design. And then maybe the execs don't get as excited and maybe they don't fund you as much, right? So again, as uh, uh, Parth said, you're not just a double-edged sword. I think it's many, many edges, many blades, and you just have to know how to navigate that as an AI leader. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's it's a great opportunity, right? Gets us thinking, gets us thinking, what else? How do we do it? How do we solve the problem? How do we make it real? How do we make it acceptable? How do you drive adoption? How do you get funding? How do you bring it to market? You know, all those questions uh, have to be answered in order to be successful. I'll add to Taj's points, I think are great. And what I'll, I'll anchor on is 
each organization developing their risk mitigation or their risk tolerance around this, right? Because fundamentally, you think about Gen AI being applied to AutoML, this is a still to be solved problem in machine learning and AI is model explainability. So even if you ever ask ChatGPT to explain what it's doing within itself, it'll give you some generic framework, but it's not gonna tell you uh, this is the specific weight that was triggered in the neural network, and this is what what's happening, right? There's a world of research going on into that. So that fundamental problem of just base model explainability continues to persist. And I think it's on organizations to be able to be comfortable with that to the right level. Um, each organization industry is going to vary in terms of the amount of regulation and, and um, uh, constraints around that. Uh, but as as a as a AI leader, it's one, getting the organization comfortable with that, promoting a literacy program to allow people to understand what's fundamentally happening. And I also think as Gen AI continues to evolve, it becomes a useful uh, expert to have a conversation with. So to take knowledge of what maybe your organization's guidelines and constraints are and help you as a modeler, your data science team, work through, well, what is the type of model that I need to be able to go with? Maybe I can't use a neural network that gets me great accuracy. I need to use a, something more simple that gives me greater interpretability and finding that right balance based upon what the organization has agreed upon. So um, those are my few thoughts on it. Yeah, I agree with Tash and Jesus. So, um, you know, Jen and I will be able to help to explain, you know, simpler models, but if we're talking and going into like deep learning, I mean, it's, it cannot do it today, right? Uh, so I would be curious to see how kind of the industry will, will evolve in the next five years. Um, in banking, regulators expect us to fully explain the models, you know, what data we use to train them, you know, what the model results are. So today, uh, again, we're waiting for the Gen AI to kind of to go up a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love the points that Taj and JC just mentioned here, right? But uh, I, I do want to highlight I see a little bit of an irony in the in the, in the question here, right? So you know, while we are talking about Gen AI helping with interpretability and transparency of models, I think what is also still a big question mark is interpretability of uh, Gen AI itself, right? So um, you know, when we talk about explainability, it's not just limited to Auto ML. It, we're still talking about like explainability for usual ML models. Uh, then comes the Auto ML models. Then perhaps. Uh, now with the, the Gen AI models. And I think uh, um, it, it's still in fairly nascent stages right now, but I feel like, um, you know, um, regulatory bodies, trust and safety teams, they're going to be watching this space very, very closely, right? Um, in, in terms of how, how Gen AI itself is evolving and, um, you know, how, how do we even interpret the data that's been used? How do we limit hallucinations? Um, how do we, uh, you know, how do we ensure there's no inherent bias um in 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 the in the conversation uh, uh, you know there's there's just a lot to it uh, when it comes to risk appetite for different organizations and the level of um you know uh, uh, uh training that's going to be or education uh, that's going to be required um for data scientists within the org you know to be doing with uh, the the rest of the business users Yeah. yeah, I think those are great points. And, and there's a sort of debate going on in the chat about hallucination and, well, don't we have ways to mitigate hallucination? Isn't that something that, that can be done already? Uh, and I think, Parth, you hit on a, a couple of really good points in that regard, which is it depends, right? I mean, there's there's the hallucinations. I mean, we, there's a lack of transparency in many cases of what data the large language models are using to in response to various queries. Um, and then there's also, I mean, different risk calculus, depending on what the use cases are, depending on what industry you're in. And so, you know, maybe if you don't have to be 100% perfect, you're okay with some level of tolerance with respect to hallucinations and with respect to biased outputs. But we're talking about things that are really high stakes or in uh, industries that are very heavily regulated, there may be zero, you know, virtually zero room for error. And so in those situations, you have to be much more mindful about hallucination and have to be much more mindful about how you deploy this in, into production um, because of those very varying risk tolerances. Um, so I think those yeah. are some excellent points. Brian, um, I, if, I can, if I can just add, add to what you just said, I, I'm, I'm watching the conversation go as well. Yeah. And, 
thank you for calling us experts, right? Uh, as experts, we tell you that we know for a fact how to design these systems. And if you don't know the underlying data set, um, number one, we just assume that everything being fed in is perfect. Uh, it has no bias, right? Which we can never tell. Uh, the second thing is um, you have to validate against hallucination. You have to guard against hallucinations, right? So it's not just me, right? But everybody here has leaders, other leaders in the company, and they all ask simple questions like, how can you assure me that there's no, there's no hallucination in here? How can you tell me that the answer is right? And, uh, you know, we work with all the large cloud providers. So recently we had a meeting uh, with AWS and we said, can you help us kind of put in the right guardrails? And, you know, we have a lot of people on that call and everybody's like, yeah, you're right. We cannot guarantee that we have all the right guardrails in place, but we will certainly go back. We'll talk to other people and we'll talk to this department and we'll talk to other scientists and, um, you know, we'll try to, to help you. So if a cloud provider, really large cloud provider like AWS cannot guarantee us 100% that there aren't hallucinations in the underlying models, uh, that, you know, the output is um, going to be problematic, maybe. You ask a difficult, see, we're all assuming that we're going to ask a straightforward question and you will get a straightforward response. But what if you ask like a different kind of question, right? What if you ask a question that is not clean or kosher or, you know, how do you know that the response you get is going to make sense? So I don't want to give any examples. We have some, we have tested it internally and, you know, the best response we got was a blank. And we said, hey, that's a lot safer than a bad response. So uh, just saying that that we're, we're always trying to mitigate that. And as a good practitioner in this field, you have to learn how to mitigate that risk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And there's a good question from Vera in the chat. Um, I'll show it on stage here about using Gen AI in, in heavily regulated industries. Uh, how can you ensure ever that it's, that it's safe to use? Do you just have a very narrow list of use cases? And I'll make that a little broader, um, not just heavily regulated industries, but in any situation where uh, there might be problems or risks associated with using Gen AI, uh, that you have to weigh that sort of in competition with the, the business value that it creates. How do you guys go about making that analysis? What kinds of guardrails do you put in place um, to be able to, to move forward in certain situations or uh, to decide in other situations that it's it's not appropriate to use Gen AI for that use case. Yeah, I can just quickly jump in there. Uh, so the way we are doing in, in Citibank is basically uh, we have uh, an established and matured MRM governance in place, model risk management. So everything what we are going to put in production, it has to be approved through that. So they have their guardrails. What we do is once we build the models, we upload all the documents, right? So that is uploaded along with the model so that they can, the MRM team can basically go through it, understand the model, but the risk associated, whether it's taller, what is the tolerance, tolerance level of the models of risk and things like that. Then once approved, then that's how we basically move into production. So this has been not perfect, but that's how we are maintaining it. But I'm sure over time it's going to be more mature and a lot of things are going to come and the industry is going to be more mature in providing more transparency and interoperability uh, to that effect. So I can comment more on that uh, from the banking perspective, right? It all depends on the use case. So if we're talking about chatbot giving, I don't know, branch hours, right? In the website, it's one thing, right? There's no risk kind of associated with it. It's something like the chat GPT-like technology give you like the wrong answer. Um, so for us, the biggest challenge is trust. And right now we actually have to manually check and compare results between different models and humans. And let's face it, it defeats the whole purpose of the automation. Um, so until we can truly trust it, uh, it's just another tool in the kit that we use. It's like, it's not a magic solution. Uh, recently we compared Mistral results to Llama 3. We do see differences. We're hoping one model is right compared to another, but really like who knows. So I think the regulators will continue to be skeptical and I am skeptical as of today as well. I'm gonna comment and maybe at the risk of speculating too much here, so forgive me a bit, but as I think forward, right? Um, 
depending on your belief of gen ai and fundamentally the the um what a transformer architecture means and how close it reflects human thinking and biological thought and so on there's a lot of debate back and forth in that across the, the uh, different areas of research but i think it's a far i don't think it's a far stretch to, to begin to imagine I mean, take healthcare. i think part of the question was if ever we achieve some kind of a metric or a way to to mitigate this well, doctors healthcare practitioners go through years of schooling get licensed go through go through examinations and, and so on right and take exams um, i think it's reasonable to think the evolution of ai regulation gets to a point where any new model might be deployed into an industry has to pass a certain level of, of exam like quality as well right so if you believe that gen ai emerges to have some some level of uh, independent agency i think that becomes something that's very feasible as we go forward into the future as well so. some kind of formal certification process yes. yeah. i agree i think you know just just to add to you know all the points that have been mentioned you're right i, I think um th there are two parts to this like one is if you're trying to build something internally if you're trying to do something in-house i think there are challenges as it relates to um uh, you know, starting off with this infrastructure, right? Um, to, to be able to achieve um, or even like use Gen AI embeddings, where do you store it? How do you build pipelines? There's, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done on that front. And, you know, related to that, I think the next bit is, um, especially in healthcare, as it relates to healthcare in particular, but then perhaps other regulated industries like banking as well, which is uh, data privacy. So I think there are some ways that I can think, you know, of mitigating um, some risks, you know, perhaps I think they both talked about like anonymization. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, there are approaches like federated learning. There's, you know, a few different ways to go about that. Um, but I think, um, you know, at, at the same time, like none of these things in, 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 in reality are, are, um, easy to achieve or, um, you know, hundred percent foolproof and, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, uh performance obviously is is always going to be a big question mark um having said all of this you know i do see perhaps like a future where we have um, you know dedicated foundation models for different use cases which you can fine tune upon and build upon so uh, in the medical industry or in healthcare space um you know there are foundational models which are being built um you know which are specifically trained on um medical knowledge medical information right and since these are very you know highly regulated um you know and perhaps uh, uh you know you you want to avoid any scary situation as, as it comes to healthcare and the medical industry i, I think there's going to be like a big play on on model evaluation and um you know reinforcement learning and um uh, you know uh interpretability uh, at the end of the day what one more thought i'll add to as well and maybe the reclassified your comments part. I think benchmarking becomes critical, right? Now, I'm in the manufacturing industry, which is very different from a regulation standpoint than healthcare or banking and so on. But you know, even even in manufacturing, a good example that we see is we have decisions being made on the on the manufacturing floor in terms of process engineering and how things flow through through the plant. And historically, those are human made decisions with a little bit of the Excel spreadsheet or, or things like that. And they, they get a certain level of accuracy. So our benchmark is always, what is that expert's current capability? And can you exceed that or not? Because you know, the alternative being a human decision, well, humans are also wrought with the ability to lie, to make things up, to, to hallucinate as well. It's all qualities of humans that we're seeing in Gen AI. And so really, in my mind, a big component comes down to how you benchmark that against the expectations of what we intend uh, gen ai like bot to be able to do right whether that's in healthcare or whatever industry it might be yeah great points and i mean a lot of what we call hallucinations are are made up of data from the internet that is asserted as a fact and it's in, an incorrect fact right so it's you know was the model really wrong in its output no it wasn't it was pulling from training data that was wrong and so um that's that is exactly uh the danger you're talking about of you know humans are not are not perfect either and so we have to have something to benchmark against of what's what's the improvement here that we're getting from gen ai 
uh, and is it is it worth doing as opposed to trusting the human? Um, so with that, we're, we're getting close on time here. So we'll wrap up with a lightning round. Um, so if each of you could just share in a word or phrase one key insight or takeaway that you'd like to leave folks with today about your thoughts on Gen AI and the evolution of automated machine learning. Uh, we'll start with you, Taj. Yeah, um, research and development, stating the obvious, and then uh, find out where the opportunity is and try to match those two and then try to figure out you know, business value because without that, uh, nobody's getting ahead, right? So always remember, you know, the professional universe connected to the business, find out what they need and try to give them what they look for. Good point. Parth? Yeah, I, I think we touched upon this, uh, you know, a few different times, but I feel like uh, data becomes more important than ever. Uh, and I, I think with Gen AI, I think there's this huge potential for, uh, you know, deriving more value out of data than ever before. Uh, we can use pretty much all the data that we have Right um, and leveraging Gen AI for for deriving the most value uh, out of it. If you're not doing that, you're le leaving business value on the table. Absolutely, JC. Agree with the the comments made and in, in the, the great dialogue we've had. The only thought here is asking a good question becomes much more critical in the future. So. Yeah, very good point, Natalia. So um, Gen AI actually could make AutoML better, but if non-experts will start using it, we're all in trouble. So my, my advice would be learn math and statistics. And when your fancy model breaks, you know you know how to fix it. Absolutely. David, we'll give you the last word. My key insight into the transformative uh, potential of Gen AI is the evolution of AutoML. Uh, which is a shift from automated optimization to automated creativity. So never stop exploring. That's my my key insight and my, that's my uh, key thought on it. If you keep exploring, the the uh, industry is going to be more mature. It's going to be, and the business is going to see a lot of value out of it uh, over time. Absolutely. Well, thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, this was a, an excellent conversation. Um, really appreciate all of you taking the time today and thank you, a special thank you to our sponsor Kumo for making this webinar possible. If you missed any of the webinar or want to rewatch anything, the recording will be available just a few minutes after the webinar if you just refresh this page. Uh, thank you again to everyone for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.